Build the lanes. A sentiment that I agree with, at least when it comes to bike lanes, but also the name of a very fantastic YouTube channel. And I had the chance to sit down with a couple of my friends who run a radio show called Bike Talk and the man behind the channel Build the Lanes, Stefan, where we discussed whether or not streets should serve people or the throughput of cars, or both, and if so, where those uses are most applicable. We looked at some streets in Los Angeles and uh, he helped us redesign them with his Dutch mindset. So sit back, enjoy, relax. I think I said that the wrong way around. But anyway, enjoy the interview with Stefan, the guy behind Build the Lanes. I, always, I think it always comes back to, and this is something I like to hammer on my channel, is asking engineers and planners and also advocates, what do you want from this road? Uh, there's a couple of things we can aim for, but generally people have to choose between two things right away, which is, do you want this place to be for flow or do you want it to be, to be for access? And generally when you make something better for flow, it gets worse for access and vice versa. So you can make a road very safe and efficient for flow, or you can make it very safe and efficient for access, but you can't really do both at the same time. But to get there, you kind of have to make that decision at a network level well ahead of time. This is kind of where I think a lot of uh, traffic engineering professionals in the US kind of go wrong, is that they're not looking really at it from a network perspective, and they just try to look at it locally. And for example, they might see some problematic intersection and think, oh, we have to make this road wider here so we can store more cars per hour. You know, we're gonna maybe paint a bike lane right next to it. And they come up with this kind of nice, very localized geometric design, but it more or less does nothing to change the reality in Los Angeles. And uh, that that's why I argue uh, on my channel, I wrote an article about this, that America doesn't have a lot of true transportation engineers uh, because mm. uh, the nobody's looking at it from that level. And we when said, well, we have our, a lot of civil engineers, uh, which we need, of course, um, and they've just only taken a couple of classes um, in mobility itself and just enough to kind of know how to do the civil engineering work on roads or the civil engineering work for intersections. But we don't have a lot of people who can take a step back and ask the really important questions that you need to get a good mobility system to even begin with. Well, one way to think about it, I, I, this is like, I, I suddenly started thinking about strodes in that there's two kinds of strodes. There's urban strode and a suburban strode. And we always talk about a suburban strode, which is, I mean, we know what it is. It's six, eight lanes with like, you know, Costco and a CVS and, you know, um, yes. huge parking lots, right? But an mm -hmm. urban strode is what we've done to LA. So we've taken streets, right? Like Be Beverly, Melrose that have sweet, you know, fountain. It has residential homes and it has a bunch of small shops. And we've tried to turn it into a freeway. We've taken all of our sweet streets and turn them into freeway. So there are a street that we've tr we're trying to make it a road. <laughs> so yeah. now nothing works. Yeah, and that's that's kind of the, the strode uh, is what we would define. Uh, in the Netherlands, we call it a chrysavich or a gray path. And that's no, when it's arguing it's trying to combine the access functions and the throughput functions. And they fundamentally erode each other at the same time. And uh, that's also like when I, when I made my video about the throughput that uh, Taylor mentioned, it was, it's this road called Douglas Boulevard in Roseville. And it's also your typical uh, suburban stroke. It's uh, six lanes wide, three lanes on each side, uh, and it has an average travel speed of 32 miles per hour. And it has, if you, if you do traffic measurements along the whole corridor at peak hour, it's around 17 to 1800 vehicles per hour, which is how much a single lane, a single 30 mile per hour lane can, can use. So quite inefficient use of money and space. Sully, um, did you want to ask something? Yes, to bring this home and into context for people in the LA area, the Move Culver City, the contentious Move Culver City project is a perfect example of what we've been talking about. I want to bring it up a uh, four lane road and narrowed it to uh, one lane in each direction in order to promote access because it's, it's the main street in their downtown, right? And so they don't want it to be a freeway. And I talked to the former mayor of Culver City uh, I ran into him at an event a few nights ago, and I said, you know, the biggest complaint you saw was people were saying that once it was narrowed, they were slowed down. I said, how much were they actually slowed down? He said, they measured during peak hours, the maximum delay compared to four lanes compared to, to two lanes. 
was a little less than two minutes. So an entire lane wasn't even worth two minutes, basically. Right. Well, that was enough, especially when you're in a car. And he said, I, I, I don't even know if people know. It looks like it's more congested as well. Because people do you are, know the name of the do you know the name of the road in Culver City that they're talking about? I Washington, can, uh, I believe, right? Yeah, Culver I think it is Washington. City. Washington in Culver City. If you look up the Culver Steps, it's the street right outside, and now they're they're rewidening it. And so you know, I think there's also a perception of traffic, right? If if there's two lanes of traffic, like Stefan said, it might still average out to thirty, but it looks like it's faster in between intersections. But when you put those people into one lane, it looks slower, but really it's just about the same. Right. And, uh, so yeah, and, and the, the the city citizens were so angry that they got a new council who tore out the multi million dollar project to narrow the road in the first place. Right. But but see, this is a kind of situation you could avoid with good transportation engineering because where where is everyone getting stuck on Washington Boulevard? That, that's an oxymoron, isn't it? At least in Los Angeles, good transportation engineering. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, Los Angeles is a case study of what you don't right. want to do. Like I, I love the. <laughs> Sorry to anyone listening from LA. I do like to kind of bash on the the roads in LA uh, on my channel, um, but what I'm driving at here is on, on Culvert City on Washington Boulevard. These car drivers, you know, where they're getting stuck and where they're getting passed by cyclists and they're getting road rage from that. That's still at the intersection itself. Now this kind of brings up an interesting point because uh, when you take away a lane, right, and you repurpose it to say cyclists or any other use, that's never a problem until you get to the intersection itself. Because when you get to the intersection itself, that's where um, cars can, can, can like back up a bit. And in the Netherlands, what we do is we calculate, hey, what are the length of the queues going to be? And that's how, um, so when we go to come to the intersection itself, you will quite often see that that one lane then flares out to three or four lanes. So you'll have say two uh, straight through lanes, a left turn lane and then a right turn lane. Um, and then, but what we do, but what we do is that we're able to move most of those cars in the queue, um, all in one, all in one signalized phase. So even though we're adding a cycle lane, because we're still flaring out at the intersection itself, um, we avoid that whole, um, disadvantage to drivers completely. And I think what's kind of happening in Washington Boulevard, looking at it briefly is that it, it's a road that's two or three lanes, just straight shot the entire way. And I guess when you remove an entire lane at the intersection itself, then you're causing some backup at the intersection itself. And that's where that's maybe where the problem comes from. You can, you can remove that problem entirely by just narrowing Washington Boulevard. So you can remove a lot of those unnecessary signals. And then uh, at, at the intersection itself, when you actually need one, well, if you have a bit of backup, the amount of time you've saved by removing those other intersections more than makes up for it. So the root cause of this is the the city not deciding what they want Washington Boulevard to be for. Do they want it to be for flow or do they want it to be for access? And that's what it that's the root cause of all of these problems. And the the argument about taking a lane away from traffic, giving it the bikes, they're all symptoms of that. It's it's just symptoms of non-existent traffic planning. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that the leaders of Culver City would be able to answer the question of whether they want a road or a street. I think they would say, we want both. And that goes right back to what you're saying. That's the problem. It can't handle both. Yeah. But what you're going to end up is what, what is right now, which is something that has the throughput of a, a single in each direction and a 30 mile per hour road. But you've built something five times wider than that. And right. uh, well, poor people of Los Angeles have to pay to maintain that. And this is also then another question you have to hit on is that wh why, when did we decide that some delay is a bad thing? Like, uh, you know, uh, the amount of delay that traffic encounters, well, that, that, that's something to think about, but it's not necessarily more important than everything else. Like, uh, why should we have to demolish the entire city just to reduce commute times by two minutes? And that's something we... Um, that's, what, that's one reason why in the Netherlands, the engineering manuals for roads are split up between uh, urban and rural. Because the assumptions in an urban area is, well, hey, traffic is something to think about in a city, but there's all these other things we have to think about, like you know, air quality, um, you know, pedestrian safety, uh, public gathering spaces. You know, we, we, have, we have to balance all those things with each other. Um, and it's not that you know, traffic isn't important, but it's a much more complex environment. And we can't just say we're going to focus on this one variable 
at completely at the expense of everything else. So in the city I work in, Harlem, it, it, it was built in the 1200s AD, you know, like they didn't have uh, modern traffic engineering practices. Um, so there, and uh, you know, there, there are some problems we have from that. For example, we don't have a proper ring road around the city. So uh, Harlem just has some chronic traffic problems, but the city has decided, you know what? This is this is the, the reality of living in Harlem. We're not going to bulldoze half of the buildings here just to make a car driver's lives easier. If you if you don't like it, take the bus, take the train, take the bicycle. It's actually maybe a little a plug in. I work for the city of Harlem and uh, we're trying to make 90% uh, of all trips inside the city um, that are under three kilometers uh, to be by bicycle or to be by public transit. Um, so, and, and that's kind of the other thing is like when you start thinking about mobility engineering is that if you run up against all these constraints inside the city where you can't make things more efficient for cars, well, your, your, your job as a mobility engineer doesn't end. Well, you have to think, okay, how else can I move people per hour? Not cars per hour, people per hour. And that's where you start thinking about bicycle lanes, public transit, wider sidewalks. And uh, you can actually solve the problem. It's that you have to choose a different mode of transportation. That also, by the way, connects back to Move Culver City because the lane they took away, quote unquote, they made a bus only lane. And what's so interesting to think about when you think about efficiency and how many people you're moving per hour, most of the time the bus only lane appears empty, right? Because it's not full of cars. But when a single bus goes by, that's 40 feet long. If it's, a, if it's full of people, which by the way, transit ridership went up, I think like 100%. Um, when that bus goes by, it's carried by as many people as you know, uh, most people, by the way, are alone in their car. So we can say like 40 cars, right? In 40 feet, they got as many people down that lane as, you know, hundreds of feet of cars would. And so it looks like looking at it, you're like, wow, this lane is empty. But every time a bus goes by, it's actually more people than are in their cars. So it's actually far more efficient use of space. Right. Yeah. And that's, and that's, a, th that, that's a thing is that in, in, pla in places that have constrained space, we say, look, we don't have enough space to give it all to the least efficient mode of transportation. Like uh, when, when we when we have space constraints, that actually that's actually what makes us reduce car lanes and say, hey, we have to move people per hour. So that's exactly why we need a bus lane. You know, if, it, if we, we don't have these giant right of ways where we can convert the entire, where we can give 200 feet uh, in either direction away to, to asphalt. Um, but yeah, I would say that the best way to uh, measure intersection efficiency is people per hour over the, the the physical area. So people per hour per square meter. You, you, you can measure the things I'm talking about yourself whenever you want to do a study. If you guys want an example of a city doing things right, I'll tell people, I, I love to tell people about what Austin's doing because uh, Austin actually put out a great infographic where they more or less summarized what I was talking about. Uh, and they said, yeah, the intersection throughput tends to be around a third uh, of a free flow lane. That's one reason why Austin, because they have this big picture, they've been able to do a lot of great work over there because they they understand where the constraints and the whole traffic system are. And when there's just wasted space, they give it to other uses. And I haven't seen that many cities who has may have who have made as much progress as Austin has. So I, when people ask me about like, okay, you're in the Netherlands, is there hope? For the U.S., I'm like absolutely. If if a city in Texas, you know, can uh, really like get their act together, um, and wh wh why can't uh, anybody else? Why can't California? The interview actually went on for close to an hour. Uh, Stefan's gonna post the full thing on his channel, so hop on over to Stefan's channel, Build the Lanes. Link in the description. And once again, thank you so much for watching. Thank you, Stefan, for joining us, and keep tuned for more Sullyville content.